a major, is such a, a major step in the history of the entire world, not just the United States. Um, so that's what I did. And um, the subtitle is The Powers of Bank Credit Creation During World War I. And it's specifically bank credit creation because what I want everyone to keep in mind is that bank credit is a means of exchange today. Bank credit is ubiquitous today. But bank credit is not true money. And I'll go into that. So there is true money and then there is true money used as a means of exchange. And then there is bank credit, which is also used as a means of ex exchange. And the financial industries today will call bank credit money. And I want you to keep in mind that it is, excuse me, I'm in New York. <laughs> There's all these uh, uh, sirens. Um, that there is black and white between money and bank credit. And it's very important to keep that uh, clear. And the history does do that. And that's what I'm going to go first into history. Okay, so Virginia, can you go to the second page? Okay. So this is qu quite extensive. We might not get through the whole thing. Um, tonight. I'll try, but I don't want to overload you. Um, I tried when I was preparing this um, presentation to eliminate as many details as I can, but there are, several, there are quotes that are, are very significant in the history, um, and I don't want to leave out things that um, could be very meaningful. So um, I, I broke the paper up into um, five different parts. And the first part is the comparison of the history of U.S. money versus this bank credit system. And the second part is the creation of the Federal Reserve System. Then we go to that period of time when the United <coughs> States is neutral. So World War I started... It can, uh, can people mute? It would be helpful if people could mute um, uh, while I'm talking. Okay. Um, and then, so World War I started um, July, August 1914 and went um, through to 1918. The armistice was November 1918. Uh, but we were neutral from the beginning of the war until April of 1917. So there's a there's a, a analysis of what was happening in this country during our period of and I it's in quotes neutrality. <laughs> we were not you'll see we were not at all neutral, but we weren't considered belligerents, right? We hadn't declared war. Then then we're gonna look at the period when we were actually a belligerent in World War One from nineteen April of 1917 to, um, to uh, 1918, to the armistice in November. And then well, I'll, I'll have some con a few concluding thoughts, just things I was left with, things that as I did the paper, I kept questioning and wondering about. And so I put that as concluding thoughts. So. Um, Virginia, you could leave this up as we go along, so it, I think it could help people. Okay, now go to the very top. Oh yeah, yeah. Go, go to the very top. Is that the very top? The yeah. Here we go. Okay. So I'll start here. The thesis. The thesis of this paper is that the use of private bank credit as a society's money is detrimental to the life of all citizens concentrates wealth and power into national institutions outside public control and is a major driver 
of imperialism and war. And I just want to give you a, a, a little insight into what's coming. This is a quote from Alexander Hamilton, our first Secretary of the Treasury under the new Constitution. And uh, in his second report to the Congress, the new Congress, he said, he was explaining uh, the system of, um, of banks, which had, were already there. He said, every loan which a bank makes is in its first shape a credit given to the borrower on its books. In other words, he was very clear that when uh, a private bank made a loan, it could create by writing in the accounting entry into the account of the borrower. And that was the creation of bank credit. There was never a bank in our history of this country that when it made a loan to a borrower, took the money from somebody else's account and moved it to the account of the borrower. That has never happened as a private bank. Uh, uh, that's not what bank credit is. Bank credit is the bank creates the accounting entry in the account of the borrower. And it's the hardest thing <laughs> for Americans that I've talked to over the years. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit. I mean, 10% of the time the person will say, oh, that's very interesting, and they'll slowly start to think about that. And 90% of the time they, they look and they go, oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, I have something I have to do. <laughs> but anyway, in this paper we'll get into it. Okay, so the first part is really the difference between the U.S. money and the bank credit system. So to get clear on that, uh, I'd like to just give a little history of uh, our government-issued money in this country. And the first thing that I was, I remember being very surprised at when I first got into monetary reform and started learning the history, was that all 13 colonial colonies wouldn't allow private banks into the colonies. They, they, the, the legislature said no. People said no. They used the British uh, coins, but then the coins were not enough because they went back to Britain to pay for taxes and to pay for um, supplies for the colonies. So in 1690, uh, Massachusetts, the legislature said, we're going to issue paper money directly from our legislature. We'll pass the law, and we'll print it up, and we'll spend it for the expenses of the colony. And so they, they printed up the bills, they spent them, and they circulated. And over the course of the next 70 years, every other of the 13 colonies began to do the same thing. It was um, an experiment, but it was an experiment that worked. And um, I will, hold on a second. I'm going to give you the quote of Benjamin Franklin. Because Benjamin Franklin was very instrumental in um, in Pennsylvania for encouraging uh, the Pennsylvania legislature to use public money. And this is um, his, his words. Uh, there was a cry among the people for more paper money. I was on the side of an addition being persuaded that the first small sum struck in 1723 had done much good by increasing the trade, employment, and number of inhabitants in the province. 
since I now saw all the old houses inhabited and many new ones building. And I remember very well when they're on their doors, they said to be let. So, so he, he, he saw, and he wrote a whole pamphlet. I think it must be like 70 pages long. I have it here. It's a little pamphlet about paper money and about how money functioned. And he was very not, I mean, he was so knowledgeable in so many areas. I mean, you know, but he was extremely knowledgeable with money and government issued money, what the colonial legislatures issued. Remember, they didn't allow banks in there. They didn't want them. A lot of the colonists, they remembered what was going on back in Europe from which they came with the poverty. And they identified the poverty, the unemployment, the suffering with their, that financial system. And they did not want it in the colonies. Okay. Uh, then we had our revolution. And uh, there, you can find a quote. I don't have it in this paper, but you can find a quote from Benjamin Franklin saying that the real cause of the American Revolution was not a tax. He said that we, the colonists could easily have dealt with the tax. It was because the parliament in England passed laws, like 1764, right around there, passed laws and told the colonies, the, the legislatures of the colonies, you have to pull in your money. We don't want you to have that money. We want you to be dependent on our money. And that, Benjamin Franklin said, was the real cause of the American Revolution. And I believe him. I believe him. Um, okay. So, uh, we had the revolution, and the Revolutionary Congress issued just like the colonial legislatures, issued paper money called Continentals. And, of course, if you're, you know, grow up in America, you're taught in school, the, you know, that the, 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 the government issued so many Continentals and there was so much inflation and they became worthless, blah, 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 blah. blah. You know, and that's, you know, you know, that's what you're left with when you, you get out of grammar school. And... Uh, What's not taught is that the Revolutionary Congress authorized a certain amount and never issued over that amount. But here in New York Harbor were these British frigates, and inside them they were uh, counterfeiting millions, millions, and millions of continentals and you if you went to some of the taverns in New York City down at you know the foot where you know all the people uh, lived and everything at that time you could go into a tavern and you could find a, a notice on the wall saying uh, so-and-so is going to be down here with the continentals come and get your continentals so the value of the continental was corrupted by the counterfeiting of the British. And this is not new. The British had, knew how to do this way before our war. And they did it um, with the French Revolution. The, Fr the, the revolutionary go government issued a paper money, and they did the same thing. They, um, they had them counterfeited up in England and then sent them into France. So a um, little piece of history. Um, okay. Uh, and even our Articles of Confederation, our first constitution after the Revolutionary War, had the power in it given to the Congress to issue paper money, a government issued paper money. That power was still explicitly there. Okay. So here we have the new country, and the next thing, uh, we have new states, and we have uh, the Articles of Confederation, and damn it, 
we get private banks coming in. And the first one, uh, 1781. Uh, the first one, chartered by the state, was the Bank of New York, Boney, who is still around today. Bank of New York. Um, it was chartered by New York State, of course, and uh, the person behind getting the charter and organizing the bank was Alexander Hamilton. And these were banks of issue. These are private banks when they make a loan contract with a borrower. You know, you always have to sign a contract, so a legal document. Uh, they created the entry in the borrower's account or these um, charters from the states gave the bank the uh, legal privilege of printing up their own banknotes and lending them out. So they did both. Um, and let me see here. Uh, by so that they started around 17. 83, something like that. By 1811, the number of banks had increased. These are state chartered banks in the U.S. had increased to 88. And by four years later, 1815, there were 208 private banks in the United States, the new United States. Um, so it was a, a, a vastly, and it increased uh, more and more borrowing from the, the private bankers to use as a means of exchange, banknotes and deposits. So um, I just want to give you a little picture into why this is happening. Uh, and it goes back to our Constitutional Convention. This, 1787, there's a call for a Constitutional Convention. And um, during this convention, a struggle took place over the, the power of the government, the legal power of the government to issue paper money. And I'll just, let me go here. Some delegates wanted the power to be explicit. Uh, you might hear the term to emit bills of credit. That was the paper money that had been created by the colonies and, and then by the Revolutionary Congress. So that's, that's the term that was used. But it's government-issued paper money. Uh, their proposal failed, didn't pass. Some delegates supporting bank credit, wish to explicitly forbid this power to the government. But their proposal failed, too. So in the end, the Constitution neither confers that explicit power nor forbids it. What is in the Constitution for the congressional power to uh, issue money is to coin money, and the C is the lowercase, to coin money, regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. And back in 1787, there's been an analysis of this. Um, to coin money with a lower C meant to create money in whatever form. It could be paper or it could be coin, right? Uh, but it was left ambivalent because of this struggle. And because of that, um, the banks got the upper hand um, and, and got their charters from the state legislatures, the charters for the banks, and opened business and started issuing their own bank notes as loans and began creating their deposits as loans to borrowers too. Um, okay. I'm going to read 
a little further from Alexander Hamilton. And I, I think it's important because this struggle between government-issued money and privately issued bank credit is is goes to the heart of our history and uh, like the first quote said Hamilton in his report to Congress in uh, 1791 he you know said every loan which a bank makes is a credit given to the borrower on its books and I'm going to com- complete what he said to Congress uh, a credit given to the borrower on its books, the amount of which uh, the bank stands ready to pay either in its own notes or in gold or silver at his option. Um, And I'll just say here, um, the banks were um, to have a reserve in their vault of gold or silver. Right, and then if anyone wanted to hand in the uh, banknote and get gold and silver, they were supposed to be able to do that without any problem. Or if someone had a deposit in the bank and wanted to turn it into gold and silver, they were able to do that uh, without any problem, supposedly. But the gold and silver in the vault of the bank, which is the reserve, was never enough to cover all of the uh, loans that the bank made. It was um, assumed by the bankers. This was their system, and their system came from the Bank of England uh, starting in 1694, and it was just assumed, well, not, not everybody will come running in to get gold and silver, so a bank does not have to have a reserve of gold and silver equal to all of its outstanding banknotes and deposits. It just doesn't. That was the nature of banking. So it would have made, you know, if you were lucky, <laughs> it would have 10% of, of what they needed. You will find in American history, it, was, it, would, it got very wild and woolly. And sometimes there was only uh, $80 <laughs> in the reserves of gold, if, you know, if you were lucky. Um, but, you know, some, some bank presidents um, had integrity, you know, and they kept enough of a gold reserve, and some didn't. Um, but you'll see in this history that even if you were a good bank um, president versus one who didn't care, who just wanted to make profit and get out of there, once the uh, people started questioning whether there was enough gold and silver for, for their deposit or for their bank notes and started going to the bank, there would be a run on the bank. And once there was a run on a bad bank, it could very easily become a run on a good bank. And the bank, the system itself, does not have enough gold and silver to pay all of its depositors. It, it, that's the nature of the system. Uh, so, um, and, you know, Alexander Hamilton is, is explaining this. He was very clear on it, 1791, and he's, he's explaining it to the Congress of the United States, the new Congress. Um, and he, and he, he also points this out. He said, but, you know, in a great number of cases, uh, no actual payment is made in, in either, in either gold or silver or banknotes because the borrower – he has, his, he has his deposit account, and, and Hamilton says he can, by a check or an order, transfer his credit to some other person to whom he has a payment to make, which is what we do today. We have our checking accounts, and we have to pay someone, and we just make a check, and we give it to them, and they deposit it, and, and they, the money goes out of our account and into their account. And, and so he's describing our system today, you know, checking accounts. And he says, uh, and in this manner, the credit keeps circulating, performing in, er- in, performing in every stage the office of money, till it is extinguished with some person who has a payment to make to the bank. 
Okay. Very critical understanding of the difference between government-issued money and private bank credit. And, and he's not hiding it, Hamilton. He said, well, you know, um, it gets extinguished when someone has to repay the bank. In other words, when you use bank credit and you as a borrower have to repay two things to the bank. You have to repay the principal of the loan, the amount the bank created and put into your checking account. You have to repay the whole thing plus the interest because this is a profit-making um, industry here. Okay, so first of all, <laughs> when the borrower makes a payment to the bank, that payment goes away from the books of the bank. And this is what Hamilton is saying, uh, till it is extinguished. So when a bank makes a loan, it increases the money supply. When the bank has the loan principal repaid to the bank, the money supply is reduced. And on the bank's books, that principal is, is uh, erased. Um, this is not government-issued money. Government-issued money gets um, spent into the economy and circulates. It doesn't disappear, you know. So you have the difference between government-issued um, money, which is a stable money supply, versus this private bank credit, which is creating uh, – when, it, when it, the banks get excited and they create loans, suddenly the money supply goes up. Today we call it asset bubbles. And then when the, the banks get a little scared of what they've just done and they stop making loans and the other outstanding loans are paying down the principal, that's extinguished off the books of the banks and the, the money supply is deflated. So you have an unstable monetary system when you have private bank credit. It's, it's like night and day. Okay. Uh, okay. What's the next thing? Uh, the struggle. Economic growth. Okay, this is very important. Our country was wealthy, we had land, we had water, uh, we had arable land, uh, we had um, a seaports. There was so much that could be developed and was developed. And in the pro and from from the beginning, that, that was one of the pushes of having bank credit, because. In order to develop this new country, um, you needed money. People needed a means of exchange. Um, I'm going to read um, a quote from Bray Hammond. Bray Hammond is, uh, he used to work for the Federal Reserve, um, and then he became an historian. And, and uh, he said, in the early 19th century, the borrowers, were the merchants, speculators, enterprisers, and promoters who were building up the modern American empire. The chronic and significant condition has been the prosperous use of borrowed funds by businessmen. And of course, we under, underwent um, industrial revolution in like the 1830s, 40s, and um, the private system of credit funded that. Um, uh, the government um, was hesitant to issue its own um, government-issued paper money. 
It was hesitant. It did issue some um, treasury notes um, during the War of 1812, uh, but the growth in the economy, the need um, to to get out there and develop this economy, um, made the explosion of state chartered banks. Um, now, just a few notes. I don't know if, if, if for you this is important to understand, but it's it's. Sue, we no longer hear you. Or I no longer hear Sue. Uh, no, I think she's either ran out of uh, time on her phone or her battery died. She's still talking, though. <laughs> Sue? Oh dear. Can you type on your screen that the, her sound is off? She may not be watching the chat. Everybody wave, everybody wave, everybody wave. Virginia, stop sharing the screen so she can see you. Stop sharing the screen. You can pull it up again later, but she's not seeing any of us. Stop sharing your screen, Virginia. It's, oh, it stopped. Okay. Sue, we can't hear you. Sue. She doesn't realize, yeah. She should see us. Oh, right. <laughs> I don't know what she's looking at. I don't either. I put it up on the share in great big letters. Um. Sue. I don't, she's not looking at us at all. Oh, no. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. We haven't been able to hear you for several minutes. Hang up and call back. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Oh, Lord. Does she want us to listen to our phones? No. no, there's nothing that we need to do. I think she needs to just call back. 
since she cannot hear us apparently, might we type that on the screen, Barbara, and suggest to her that she hang up and call back? That's a good idea. We apologize for the technical difficulties here. Technology is wonderful. And <laughs> yes, it is when it works. <laughs> yep. Loud and wonderful. Yeah, I don't know how to turn my camera off, so I have to cover it with tape when I want my face to go away. <laughs> so. Oh, you know what? On the bottom, the bottom yep. left hand corner, Near there's the a small camera and you can stop video that way. There's also a uh, mute. My, my video. Or your my, video. My fit. Oh, on, fit. on your can Zoom you, can, screen. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, one, what was the last thing you heard? <laughs> I hope it wasn't too far back. Uh, a good bit. I think you were describing the reasons for the explosion of state chartered banks due to the growth in the economy. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's good. Okay. Right. Oh, that's good. That's not too bad. So uh, what I, um, I, I, did you hear the part where I said there was a change in the chartering of the state banks? No. No. Okay. So I'll start there. Um, in the late 1830s, the state legislatures stopped chartering banks, but a person could go to the state administrator and, and, and get an okay to open a bank. And under this system, there was more auditing by the state of the books of the banks. So there were, it was an improvement in that way. Um, it didn't get rid of all of the rascals that just wanted to make money, um, you know, off of people and, and then, you know, drop the bank and run away, you know, leave people uh, holding their bank notes and their bank deposits, but no gold or silver, you know. Um, and so that was a, a, a change. And the other thing that happened was um, Lincoln's, uh, and the greenbacks, major, major, major. Um, this was um, the Civil War. And the government didn't have much money. The Congress, certain people in the Congress supported Lincoln, and they passed a legal tender law, and they issued government-issued paper money. Yay! <laughs> Finally! And, uh, and it helped, it helped um, save the union. Uh, the bankers hated it. They tried to get rid of it. Uh, they tried for years to get rid of it. And it, it finally, they, they, they finally said, okay, we'll restrict the circulation. They got a law through to restrict the circulation of the greenbacks to $347 million. But they remained and they were there and people wanted them. They wanted this government issued money that didn't disappear like bank credit, you know, and it was legal tender for the government. They could pay their taxes, their fees, their customs, uh, duties, um, and it was there to, re and, and, and throughout the second half of the 19th century, there were various third parties in this country specifically for issuing greenbacks. We want greenbacks as the money. We don't want the bank credit. Um, so it's very strong. And, and in the 19th century, uh, Americans were more aware 
of what real money was, what the government issued money was, and they were more aware of what this bank credit was, you know, uh, which was this system that uh, <laughs> made money for the bankers and you couldn't trust uh, because, you know, you might not get your, your gold and silver, your government money out of their reserve. Um, okay. The, there was one other thing that happened in the Civil War monetarily. Not only did we get the government-issued paper money, the greenbacks, but uh, there was passed a law, the National Bank Law. Okay. Now, these were, this was uh, under the auspices of a new controller of the currency in Washington, D.C. He was created with this new system. And he was to audit and be uh, responsible for opening nationally charted banks, like the First National Bank of Milwaukee or the First National Bank of New York. Um, and this, the way this worked and, and was, okay, make this simple. The national, they were private banks. They could issue their own banknotes, but they had to back them with U.S. Treasury um, bonds. They had to buy U.S. Treasury bonds and deposit them in Washington with the controller of the currency, and they could issue banknotes up to 90% of the value of those bonds and then later became 100%, but they couldn't overissue it. So in other words, these national bank notes um, were backed by these treasury bonds, which if the bank got into trouble, the control, controller could sell the bonds, get the gold and silver, and, get, and return it to the note holders. Now notice it was backing the notes uh, the bonds did not back the deposits, but the bank was supposed to have a certain percentage of their deposits as gold and silver in their reserves. And, um, and it was up to the controller uh, to send his auditors out to audit that. Okay. Uh, now, the role... So, so the, all of this economic activity is going on. I mean, it, it was is quite uh, what happened in the ni 19th century of, of the growth in this country. The production of corn and wheat increased 40% and 73%. Cotton, this is the decades leading up to the Civil War. Cotton went from 2.5 million bales to 5.4 million bales, an increase of 116%. Um, railroad mileage went from 9,000 miles to 30,000, 30 and a half thousand miles. Um, the McCormick Reaper, which you know used it by the farmers, went from 700 vehicles in 1848 to 10,000 vehicles in 1868. That is, the, that is the increase in the growth of the economy uh, and the manufacturing and the railroads. Um, it was quite spectacular. And, uh, and, of course, most of it was funded by the bank credit system. Okay. So now, after the Civil War, you have coming in to the financial um, part of the economy, the investment banker, okay? And uh, he was not a commercial banker. He was very different from the commercial banker. He was a private bank, and he was not charted by either the state or the national government, right, like the state banks um, or the national banks, right? Uh, they were individual proprietorships or partnerships. Um, 
and they were not authorized to issue banknotes or accept deposits. Uh, so what were they? Okay. They were financial institutions that had pretty much been successful in commercial operations uh, and what they became expert at was buying from the new corporations because remember all the, the corporate corporations were increasing humongously so you you know you had railroad corporations you had manufacturing corporations sh shipbuilding corporations um, uh, the corporate structure had been introduced massively into the economy up to that point so what the investment banker what his expertise was is he would buy from a corporation their new offering of stocks or a new offering of, of their bonds, loans, you know. And he would buy it from the corporation, and then he would turn around and sell it on the stock market or the bond market. And uh, he would make large fees off of the corporation, when he bought um, their stocks and their new stocks and new bonds. And of course, he bought them low because he wanted to make a profit. And then when he sold them, you know, he made a profit off the sale uh, to the investors who were buying stocks and bonds in our stock and bond markets. So he was this middleman, right? Uh, but they made a lot of profit off of doing that, and they became very good at it. And the one thing that is significant, and I, and I have it here, I think I, I put it here, uh, I don't put it in here, okay, is that these investment banks used the commercial bank credit to fund their system. So, you know, they don't use their own money. They're not going to put their own money out there uh, at that much risk. So what they would do is they would uh, they had relationships, especially like J.P. Morgan was the major one in the last half of the um, the century and into the new century. Uh, he had relationships and and a lot of influence with New York banks, commercial banks. So. He would borrow the money he needed, his, his company would borrow it from the commercial banks who would create it and give them a deposit. And then, uh, the, then the J.P. Morgan company would take the deposit and use that to buy the stocks and bonds from the corporations, the new stocks and bonds, and, uh, and then sell them and make profit all along the way. And then, you know, from his, his humongous profit, he would repay his loan to the commercial bank. So it was to he, – he sort of sat on top of the bank credit system, using it in the most profitable way. Um, Privately profit, profitable. Oh, yes. Oh, this is all private. This is the whole system is for profit, you know. The public be damned, you know. <laughs> um, so this is this is another way to think about. It. I learned a lot about this here. I'm going to read this. So when he um, when he sold uh, the stocks and bonds on the stock and bond market, he was taking the funds from the investor. Giving them by like giving them the stock and taking their funds and moving it to his account. Same for the bond market, right? He would sell them the bond, and then the investor would pay for it, and the and their funds, their bank credit, would go from their account to his account, right? Um,
and he could easily manipulate the prices of the security. So I'm, I'm, um, I didn't see if I have it here. Uh, no, I think it comes later how they would skin the hide of the investors. You know, they, they, would, they, they would sell it, the hype would be there, the investors would buy it, and then something would happen and the price would fall. But the investor's money was already in his account. The investor's credit had already been moved to his account in the sale. So he didn't care, right? He had made his profit. And um, the investment banks got more and more powerful because, remember, there was more and more um, growth, more and more corporations, more and more stocks and bonds that were needed to raise the to, <laughs> to uh, skin the hide of the uh, you know ordinary person who wants to buy those stocks and bonds and and get the money into the hands of the investment banker and the corporations. And uh, so, what developed was something called the the trust. And I'm going to re- read you something from an uh, historian Charles Geist, G-E-I-S-S-T. Quote, the years 1895 to 1904 witnessed the first big mergers and acquisition boom. The amalgamations were helped and in some cases instigated by Wall Street investment banks, particularly J.P. Morgan and Kuhn Loeb, the leading houses. And I'll just say here, uh, in 1902, uh, Paul Warburg, whose name is associated with the creation of the Federal Reserve Bill, came over from Germany um, and became a partner in Kuhn Loeb in New York City. Um, and here's a quote from Gustavus Myers. Gustavus Myers is, writes, he wrote wonderful books. He was one of the um, muckrakers, they called him. But he was a very uh, wonderful writer. I'm just going to read you a little. uh, Quote, when McKinley took office, 1901, the middle class looked on impotently while factories, railroads, gas and electric plants, street railway lines, telephone systems, and mines were converted from a state of individual or mere corporate ownership into the trust form owned by great single corporations with stu- stupendous amounts of capital, capital, gold and silver, or bank credit, whatever you can use you know, in your business. The great magnates control vastly powerful New York banks. The stock issues of the Steel Trust, that was the 1901 Steel Trust, the $1 billion business, biggest in the world ever at that point, as well as those of many other trusts were sold to the banks, the commercial banks. And I'll just, I'll just, I was going to hold this off till later, but I'm just going to say now, based on that, not only do commercial banks have the legal privilege to create the deposit in the borrower's account, they have the legal privilege when they buy a stock or a bond, they have the legal privilege to create the deposit in the seller's account. So when Citibank buys a treasury bond, they just create the credit and put it in the treasury's account, and they get the bond and they put it on their balance sheet. They own it. Now, when they have to sell that bond which they now own, when they they have to sell it, then the money they receive from the buyer is extinguished, erased from their balance sheet. It's it's similar to when they make a loan or when they buy a stock or bond. Um, And it goes on all the time today. It was going on back then. Okay. And it comes in handy. To, you have to know that when it comes to World War I and uh, who's buying 
our Liberty bonds, our Treasury Department Liberty bonds. Uh, you know, okay. Uh, and I'll just mention the Pujo Committee because this this trust, um, these trusts were going on, and J.P. Morgan was was one of the major companies that was involved with developing these trusts. But there were other ones like Kuhn Loeb and Kidder Peabody and blah, blah, blah. Um, and the public was getting very upset with all of this uh, concentration of financial power. So in 1912, the Congress had the Peugeot Committee investigate if there was a money trust, right? And uh, Pujol was uh, from Louisiana. He was uh, um, on the committee. He was the, the chairman. Uh, Congressman Ar Arsene Pujol. And it's interesting. Uh, but it, it's fascinating to read and to see that they, they put together so much information I was overwhelmed when I, I was so struck dumb when I saw it. I mean, I got, I got a copy of it from uh, my New York public library. They, they, they got a I forgot, they found a copy and they brought it to New York and I opened it up and they really did delve into it. But the, this is the committee did not find, they didn't find a single money trust. That would be unlawful under the Sherman Antitrust Act or, or acts like that. But they did find, this is from them, they did find a dangerous concentration of money and credits in the hands of a few men of great power in the financial world. Right? But it was, it was nothing they, that was illegal, like, you know, it wasn't against an antitrust law. And uh, I can show you, uh, I don't know, how are we doing with time? What time is it? <laughs> it's an hour and 43 minutes. We've been going for an hour and 43. Oh. Well, let, let's... I'm not going to finish this tonight. <laughs> oh, dear. What should I do? Okay. Because the next part is the creation of the Federal Reserve, which is very... Um, you can't really rush through it, you know. Um, uh, just to, do we need a five minute break? Um, is it anybody? That, that would be good. How about questions after the break? Okay, well, let's just take a five minute break. So if anybody needs to um, use the restroom or something, get a drink of water, and then um, it's 5:44. So at 5.50, we'll start up again. Okay.
Okay, we're ready to start back up. Uh, right now it's um, 5.50 and we're scheduled to go to 6.30. Uh, and it is very clear that we won't uh, get through Sue's whole outline. So we'll work to set up another, maybe at the next coffee house or our coffee house team will work to schedule the rest of Sue's uh, very interesting talk. Um, and again, though, I, I, I do want to just welcome those people who are new to us and um, invite you to visit our website, monetaryalliance.org, um, to learn about our alliance and hopefully uh, join us on a path toward creating a money system that can pay for a better world. Uh, we also have a cam our campaign, the campaign that the Alliance is supporting uh, of how we pay for a better world, which is a campaign to contact our Congress people about studying the money system. And you can find information on that at howwepay.us. So are you back, Sue? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. All right, okay. on. Um, question, any questions so far? I don't have anyone on stack. Oh, okay. Oh, good. People are understanding me. That's important. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go. The next part is the creation of the Federal Reserve System. And it can be very detailed. I'm, I'm going to try not to dip into the details, but some of the details are important to know because they impact our our nation and the world okay first of all it was very controversial creating uh, a federal reserve system um, one senator who was very vocal against it was Charles Lindbergh senior the father of the aviator uh, he wrote books about it he gave speeches in Congress. And I'm just going to read you. Um, he was a representative from Minnesota. Uh, here's some of his quotes. The governments have delegated to the rich the privilege of making the money and charging the rest of us for its use. In Congress, he declared, this act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs this bill, the invisible government by the monetary power will be legalized. And then he also said, money is the means of exchange among all people. Its regulation is absolutely a governmental function and the government has no natural inherent power that enables it to impart to money any other property or quality than that of making it the agent of exchange. And of course he was referring to in the bank credit system, it is an agent of profit. Um, okay, so it's 1913. The bill is going through Congress. Um, at, up to this point now, state and national governments have set minimum bank reserves for their chartered banks of issue. Now, the state banks, it's interesting. Uh, you know, going back to the Civil War, we had the National Bank Act, and the controller of the currency in Washington was now in charge of of uh, chartering at the national level national banks and overseeing them, uh, auditing them. Uh, at the same time that that bill was passed, uh, part of the, one of the bills was that they, the Congress laid a tax 
on the issuing of state banknotes. They, they wanted to get rid of state banknotes and just have the national bank notes circulate. And that, and that tax did do that. And a lot of the bankers, the national bankers thought, well, you know, uh, the state banks will go out of business. You know, they can't issue banknotes, but that didn't happen. They just issued their deposits when they made loans. You know, they, they stopped issuing state bank notes, and they just issued their deposits. Um, and they, they, the banks didn't go away, and they increased in number, actually, state banks. Uh, so uh, at the point at which the Federal Reserve law was being considered, the government issued money in the hands of the people, um, the money that people knew wouldn't go away or be extinguished or, you know, be lost, you know. Um, it was the gold and silver coins coined by the Treasury. That was legal tender. We were on a gold, uh, official gold standard. Um, and then you had um, other money issued by the Treasury that – could be redeemed for gold, and that could the Treasury started after the Civil War issuing uh, gold certificates that represented gold in the Treasury, and they would circulate it as paper money issued by the government. Um, and we had the greenbacks, so that was other paper money issued by the government. And we had silver dollars, which were coins, um, which were at par with gold, and they circulated, and and then the Treasury also issued silver certificates for silver they had in the Treasury. So uh, the, the people would want this paper money because, you know, it didn't go away. <laughs> you know, they could get, always get gold for it. Um, so you had uh, gold and silver coins, gold and silver certificates, um, greenbacks, and they all uh, were used interchangeably by people by the population. Uh, and there was one more paper currency that the people accepted at par, equal, with all of the uh, government-issued money, and that was the national bank notes, the notes themselves, because they were backed by treasury bonds, which was, to them, you know, could always be sold and they'd get their gold for their uh, bank deposit, right, or their get their gold for their bank notes. So it was the bank notes, the national bank notes. And the, so the public had confidence in the national bank notes too because of the backing. Uh, so the gold coins, the law, oh, and um, the gold and silver certificates, the silver dollars, the greenbacks, all of those, you'll hear the term lawful money. Um, the gold and silver coins were the legal, legal tender, but the other treasury issued, the certificates, the greenbacks, um, they were called lawful money, uh, still government-issued money, and they could, you could get gold for them. Um, so all of this was government-issued, and, and the people wanted it, and they, they knew it wasn't going to go away. Uh, however, the the bank pa panic still happened, you know, because you have this banking system that only has a small reserve of gold and silver, and if everybody runs to the bank to get their gold and silver, it's not there for everybody. Maybe the first 10 people get it. You know, who knows? Uh, so there was this growing call, we need a lender of, of last resort something that can get currency out into the hands of the people when they want it. Uh, and, and, you know, every year when the crops would come in, the farmers would need currency to, you know, to, to pay their bills, pay their labor, and, and sometimes it would be hard to get it from the banks, and there'd be, you know, uh, is it going to be a panic or not? So there was this um, concern we need some lender of last resort, okay, and 
especially if suddenly there was a big spurt in business growth, well, we need currency for that. And the government issued money, uh, the gold and silver coins, the lawful money, the national banknotes. They, they didn't expand very fast at all. So there was this call for a new um, bank, a government uh, central bank that would be a lender of last resort. And how would, how would this new Federal Reserve, how would it get currency into the hands of the people? And one of the major um, reasons in the law, and it's, it's in the title of the law, um, is uh, the creation of Federal Reserve notes. This was new, a brand new paper money. And uh, Bob Petit would, would always, uh, he'd say, well, the Federal Reserve notes are debt. And I would never understand what he meant. So, so when I did this research, I, re- I found out what he meant. Um, okay, so the Federal Reserve note in the law itself says it is an obligation of the U.S. government. An obligation is a debt. So the Federal Reserve banks are issuing Federal Reserve notes, which are debts of the government. Our Treasury Department issues Treasury bonds, which are debts of our government. It's a debt. Again, the bank credit system is a debt money system. Um, Okay. How was the Federal Reserve, these 12 new Federal Reserve banks, how are they going to get these Fed notes out into the hands of people, right? Um, how, how are they going to get them into the commercial banks, their member banks? All the national banks, by law, had to become members of the Federal Reserve System. It's part of the law. State banks could join if they wanted to and met requirements. But all the national banks from day one were member commercial banks in their Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, So not only could the Federal Reserve Banks issue Federal Reserve notes to their member banks, but the way that they issued them to the member banks was they bought the loan contracts from the member banks. So in other words, if I'm the New York Fed and there's Citibank back then, um, I would say, oh, I'll take that loan that you just made, Citibank, and uh, I'll buy that from you and I'll give you Fed notes in payment. So you'll have the Fed notes and I'll have the loan and, um, and you can take those Fed notes and when someone comes into the bank and uh, wants some paper money, you can give them paper money, this new, the new Fed notes. Um, so back then at the Federal Reserve uh, creation uh, in the law, the bank loans that could be used in this transaction um, were called commercial paper, and they were short-term loans based on business activities, you know, like um, uh, getting a crop uh, into, you know, into town, you know, or um, moving that, moving uh, the produce around in order to get it to the cities or something like that, something that would be, happen within three months. So the loan would not would not would be payable within three months. Okay. Okay. Um, also, in the new Fed law, the Act also gave the twelve Federal Reserve banks authority to buy bank loans from their members that the members had made, secured by the bonds and notes of the government of the United States. 
which were the treasury bonds from the treasury, you know, um, raising money as a loan. And that power it was in the Federal Reserve Law, but it wasn't used until World War I started and we entered the war. But it was there. Um, the, the Treasury wasn't uh, needing a whole lot of uh, borrowed funds in order to operate at that time, so it wasn't, the power wasn't used, but it was there in the original law. Um, and uh, there's a section here about, uh, you know, the question always arises, is the Federal Reserve System, is it public or private? And um, in my studies over the years, I see it as mostly private. Um, and back, even back then, uh, I'll give you some of the quotes. Okay. Uh, well, Friedman and Swartz, very well-known economists who studied um, uh, the money system um, from the Civil War through to ni uh, ni 1960, uh, they said, able and persuasive men at the reserve banks exert influence by the weight their views carry in the decisions of the board or the system as a whole rather than directly through independent action by the banks. So the people that were part of the boards of directors of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks, um, the people that were uh, on the advisory board to the Federal Reserve Board, they were experienced, important, well-known, uh, Bankers who had a lot of influence with other bankers and with with you know in in their in this whole banking field. Uh, Paul Warburg, uh, the really the architect of the Federal Reserve Act, he said this. Uh, uh, well, actually. His friend, the wealthy businessman Irving Bush, said to Paul, Irving Bush said to Paul Warburg, quote, in theory, the control of the Federal Reserve Board is general. In practice, the real banking operations of the country will be carried on under the direction of the officers and directors of the Federal Reserve Banks. And the Federal Reserve Board will only exercise control upon certain fundamental questions involving public welfare. And decades later, there was the a chairman of the Federal Reserve Board during um, Roosevelt in the 30s was Marina Eccles from Salt Lake City. And he said, and he was a longtime chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, he said, over the years, practices had grown up inside the system, which had reduced the reserve board in Washington to impotence. The system had originally been designed to represent a blend of private and public interests. Private interests acting through the reserve banks had made the system an effective instrument by which private interests alone could be served. Um, and two things that I recently learned from another monetary reformer this year was that, that um, the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, you know, that's, it's not a bank, it's just a board. There's no money there. But their salaries are paid by the Federal Reserve Banks, not by the government. I was surprised. I, I thought they were government employees, but their, their salaries are paid by the, the Federal Reserve Banks. And, um, and each Federal Reserve Bank pays its own expenses from its own earnings, and it doesn't go to government. It's not part of the budget. So um, 
these are all things pointing to uh, it's there for private profit and private power. Um, okay. So I talked about how the Fed notes are debts of the United States. And it gets a little bit detailed. I don't know if I'm going to go into um, the nature of Fed notes. Um, but they had, at the beginning of the Fed, by law, the Federal Reserve Bank had to have gold reserves and commercial loan reserves strictly for their, any Fed notes that they issued to their member banks. So the Federal Reserve notes were not legal tender. They, 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 you, you know, they had to be backed by gold and commercial paper. And um, I'm just going to read you this. Uh, <laughs> this is Paul Warburg, February 29th, 1916. Uh, we have, we're not in the war yet. Right? We're uh, supposedly um, neutral. He says, uh, and he's writing to uh, Representative Carter Glass, chairman of the House Committee on Banking and Currency. Uh, who was key in 1913 to convincing the Congress to pass the act. So he writes, uh, in 1916, he writes, all of which goes to show that there is too much gold carried in the pockets of the people and in the vaults of the banks, that there is not enough concentrated in the Federal Reserve Banks, and that their lending power today, meaning the bank for reserve banks, is not sufficient to give us a feeling of reliance in the strength of the system. I shall not at this time make any exhaustive argument for vesting Federal Reserve notes with legal reserve qualities. I, as you know, I am profoundly convinced that sooner or later this step will have to be taken. In other words, what this law was meant to do, not just be... Uh, a lender of last resort, but issue those Federal Reserve notes. Get them into the hands of the people, right? And get the government issued money out of the hands of the people. Get it into the reserves of the banks, the commercial banks. And, and you will see that during World War, uh, I think it was beef, right either during our neutrality, I have it here somewhere, when we were neutral in the war or when we were in the war, um, they changed the Federal Reserve Law, the Congress uh, changed it so that the only reserves that the commercial banks could have in the, their Federal Reserve Bank was the gold so that they and they could only the only reserves would be the gold coins the gold gold bullion gold coins in other words the federal reserve law itself is a way of getting federal reserve notes government debt into the hands of the people right so they're holding these paper paper money and getting the government issued money out of the hands back into the bank's vaults, and, and then all the gold into the Federal Reserve. And, of course, the ultimate um, gold act was um, when Roosevelt took us off of the gold standard domestically. I think it was 1934, 33, 34, right? So you can never redeem anything for gold from... from um, from uh, the Treasury, and then uh, Nixon took us off of the international gold standard in August of 1971, and governments around the world couldn't redeem their U.S. dollars for gold from our New York Fed. Um, but it started here. Let's get government-issued money. Uh, the gold and silver coins and the paper money, the real money, the, the money that doesn't disappear. Let's get it out of the hands of the people and into the coffers 
of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. And um, the war did a big step to doing that. And you'll, and you'll see when we get to that point, because um, the Federal Reserve, um, that, that commercial banks were buying U.S. Treasury debt, the Liberty Bonds, to fund us in the war and the allies in the war, huge, huge amounts never before seen in this country. And they were buying it with bank credit, and then they were um, selling it. Uh, and at that point, there was another change in the federal law. And they, the commercial banks, that they didn't, not only didn't have to sell it to their Federal Reserve Bank, they could use it as collateral and get loans of Fed notes from their, from their Federal Reserve Bank. So the war was a big step in all these Federal Reserve notes getting into the hands of the people. And, of course, the gold and the lawful money, the government issue money, get taken out of the hands of the people and put into the reserves of the bank. Um, you know, as... as uh, Paul Warburg said, there's too much gold carried in the pockets of the people. <laughs> you know, we need it in the Federal Reserve. Uh, and here's, this is, the, this is the, the name of the act, an act to provide for the establishment of Federal Reserve banks to furnish an elastic currency, that's the Fed notes, and to afford a means of, and they use this very bank jargon, rediscounting, but it means basically purchasing commercial paper loans to establish a more effective supervision of banking in the United States and other purposes. But the, the main purpose right there is get those Federal Reserve notes out, that's the elastic currency, out into the hands of the people, and um, buy those commercial paper loans from the member banks so that that's how you get the Fed notes to the member banks and then they get them out to the hands of the people. That's, that's in the title of the bill itself. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, you've Here's got another about, poll. You've got, a, you've got about 10 minutes. So think about wrapping up and you have one question. Okay. Um, I just want to say this other quote from Paul Warburg, because I could spend two hours just on him. He's fascinating. Um, uh, he, he talked about uh, this subject of the Fed notes and the government money in a speech to a convention of bankers in September 1916. Uh, oh, he, this is his words to the bankers. Ultimately, we must rid our country of the confusing multiplicity of currency with which we are now afflicted. The circulating currency of the country ought to be silver certificates in small denominations and Federal Reserve notes. The best place for gold and gold certificates will be in the Federal Reserve banks. And then he says, goes on and he says, a greenback and a Federal Reserve note are as different as day and night. The one issued as a perpetual currency, that's the um, greenback, and the other issuable, expanding and contracting with the needs of business is understood, expanding and contracting, and secured by a generous minimum reserve of gold. So that's what, you know, and he was uh, the architect of the system. And I'll just say something about our neutral period uh, of World War I, and that'll make you curious about the rest. Um, in the first week of August, 1914, the war began. The first week of August. On August 9th, the firm of J.P. Morgan asked U.S. Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan if the U.S. government would object to loans being made with the belligerent nations. 
they they didn't wait. The investment bankers did not wait. Brian advised President Wilson not to support this policy. He said, what, what, part of what he said to Wilson was, I know of nothing that would do more to prevent war than an international agreement that neutral nations would not loan to belligerents. But eventually Wilson agreed, and he decided that he would permit these loans. Right? On January 15, 1915, the firm of J.P. Morgan signed a commercial agency agreement with the British government by which it entered into a wide range of purchasing and contracting arrangements with American firms on behalf of the United Kingdom. That was in January of 1915. The war had been going on for, what, four months, five months. In May of the same year, 1915, France signed a similar agreement with the J.P. Morgan Company. And F. William Engdahl, he's written a number of very powerful books, is a historian. He, I'm going to quote from him. Morgan served as intermediary for His Majesty's government in arranging purchases of munitions, arms, uniforms, chemicals, in short, all that would be needed to wage a modern war in 1914. As financial agent for the British government, J.P. Morgan and Company not only organized the financing of war purchases and decided which companies would be the suppliers, but it also set the prices at which the equipment would be supplied. Not surprisingly, corporations directly in the Morgan and Rockefeller groups of companies, remember the trusts, were the prime beneficiaries of Morgan's astute purchasing. In 1916 alone, American industry, despite the nation's official neutrality, export, exported a staggering $1.3 billion worth of war munitions to England and France by the eve of America's entry into the war, which was April of 1917, J.P. Morgan and Company had organized the export of some $5 billion worth of war material to the English and French and later Italian governments, all bought on credit, <laughs> organized by the J.P. Morgan Company, such an amount equivalent to $90 billion in contemporary dollar value had never before been transacted by a private bank group. Remember, the investment bankers were private. And this is Engel's final quote. It was enough to cause a major banking crisis should the loans default. Well, were they going to default? Uh, so let's consider that the... Um, <laughs> yes. The yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the big question. <laughs> that's the hang, hanger on. The answer will <laughs> But you do have two questions. Mike Holden, you had a question for Sue? You want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. It, it's in the chat, but um, I was wondering, in your research, if you had found any uh, sort of defining features at that time and sort of like the the conceptualization in that era of the difference between a trust and a corporation? Well, the corporation has a corporate charter, right? They're chartered by states. Um, but the trust is a financial um, web. So, uh, and I didn't get into it, I didn't have time, but on, the Pujol Committee analyzes <clears throat> the relationship between the investment bank, whether it's Morgan, they were the major ones at that point, or Kidder Peabody um, or Kuhn Loeb, and their control and influence on the commercial banks, the major commercial banks in New York and Chicago and St. Louis. They were the big, the big banks, mostly New York to, became the biggest one. They, 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 
control them by interlocking directorates. So a lot of the Morgan partners would be on uh, the boards of 20, one partner would be on the boards of 20 different banks, you know. And um, so through all of the, they would have holding companies. So the holding company would buy stock in all of these banks. And through that, there was what was built up was this, this um, community of interest between these um, investment banking firms that had all this influence over the commercial banks that were creating the credit, right? And, and, and then also buying the investment banks and the, the commercial banks would buy the stocks of the industrial companies. And so you had J.P. Morgan Company creating U.S. steel from consolidating all these steel companies into one big U.S. steel. And, and when he sold those stocks, you know, he got, by doing that, he got a lot of stock, U.S. steel stock, and he sold it to, to the investors uh, on the, the stock, you know, the stock market, and they all thought it was the greatest thing since, uh, I forget what the, you know, since, uh, <laughs> I don't know, Ring, Ringling Brothers Circus or something, and they bought it, and, it, and in three years, it, they lost most of their money from it. From the stock of the U.S. Steel, you know, so so those kinds of um, financial power over the industrial corporations as well as the um, commercial banks, it was all um, it was a it was a trust. It was as Peugeot said, his committee said, uh, a, a dangerous concentration of financial power over the industrial and banking industry. And that and one of the things I thought of when I was doing this research, I kept saying to myself, "Oh, well, I don't remember in my American history where these trusts really ever went away. They just sort of seemed to go out of the minds of, you know, out of the media or out of the minds of people, and they never did go away." They became institutionalized, and and what we have today are these. Uh, and there's there's a we research done three or four years ago um, in Europe, and published. Uh, they analyzed all these multinational corporations around the world, and they they came up with the 88 corporations that had the most control. You know, and they were all financial institutions. So yeah, there was a similar study fairly recently um, about uh, the United States being an oligarchy, and it cited uh, like 144 um, uh, corporations that had control over the vast majority of the world's resources. But I guess my question is more at like the the time at the time of that this was being written or, or that it was undertaken. It's my understanding that you know a, a trust nowadays is sort of like you can, you hear charitable trust. You don't really hear the term trust referring to a conglomeration of interests anymore. So uh, about 100 years ago, it's my understanding that the trust really referred to the modern conceptualization of a corporation. No, it's bigger than a corporation. It was like a, a, a whole interlocking community. Of, you know, so, well, so that, ex that still exists, right? So interlocking boards of directors still exist. It's only now it's, it's called a corporation. No. So somebody disagrees it's a holding with company. You know, it's that's a corporation, corporation, a holding company. But they hold the control of the other corporations. Uh, isn't that's a corporate? Isn't a corporation organized for a specific purpose, either to produce a product or a service, and that is their function? In other words, they get a charter mostly from state governments. There are a few federally chartered corporations. But a corporation is chartered for a specific purpose, uh, whereas a trust has a, a, an obligation to the uh, capital within the trust rather than to produce a product. Well, Understood. Remember that, that, the, that the investment banks were private. They, 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 they weren't chartered corporations. They were private partnerships. 
so, so I guess my question is, is kind of about like, it, I understand what you're saying about, you know, our understanding of the difference between a corporation and a trust in, in terms of today's language, but was it the same back then? I, I don't know how to answer yeah. that. I, I know. Well, corporations existed back then too, chartered corporations. Yep. So there's no difference. Well, yeah, I, yes, understood, understood. Um, I guess I was wondering, you know, over time you see these changing definitions, right? Things have a, a tendency to sort of change over time. And I was, I was wondering if maybe back then things were a bit different, but I guess from what I'm hearing, that is not the case. Right. No, I would say it's the same. It's just um, bigger. Well, there's antitrust legislation, not anti-corporation legislation. Right, right. But it's applied to corporations. That's the thing. I mean, uh, it was applied to, um, you know, the oil companies, right? Standard Oil was, was broken up. That was considered a trust. Um, and it broke up into what they called the Seven Sisters, right? Um, and so that's where you get the modern-day oil companies. Mm -hmm. So, again, I mean, I... Personally, it, from what I've read, I don't, I don't really know of, of much of any formal difference other than, as you're saying, a charter that exists and also a purpose of the organization as chartered, um, whereas a, a trust may be a bit more nebulous and may not have those formal uh, uh, implements. Right. Right. And J.P. Morgan would talk, always talk about a, we have a community of interest uh -huh. among you know, the, the investment banks and the commercial banks had this community of interest. So, you know, it was to everyone's interest to cooperate at the very highest levels. Yeah. I, the reality is I don't really see any difference. And, and I think that, you know, if, if the if trust busting was also to include corporations, we'd be living in a much different world now. If, if that was sort of in scope for, yeah. for Roosevelt's <laughs> trust busting, things would be totally different now. I think it's really a sort of a linguistic twist. So trusts don't exist because of trust busting. Corporations exist because there was no corporation busting. Right. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt just for a minute because our time is up. And there were two other people who had a question, Tim and Paul. Um, yeah, if, um, if people are willing to hang on for another uh, five, maybe 10 minutes to let those two people answer questions, but we won't take any more questions at this point. Does that sound good? Okay, so Tina, you had a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering why the greenback, although it was government issue, it's not being called elastic, because ultimately uh, it was created out of as a fiat currency, and ultimately it went the way of all fiat currencies. Uh, it was extinguished. So it looks to me like it was elastic. It, the only difference is the elasticity was under government control rather than under private control. Well, At least it had a vested interest in. The, the greenback, um, when it was issued in the Civil War, it was it, issued up to $400 million. And it, the bankers came in over the next decade and they, they, had, um, they tried to pass laws to get rid of it totally, and they couldn't. So they settled with restricting the government. There was the law that went through Congress that restricted the government to keeping in circulation 370, whatever I said before, million and they couldn't issue they were not allowed to issue them and they they, they circulated uh until i think 1971 when uh it was 71 something like that where there was this law that went through congress you know no one heard about it and said well we're not going to reissue any old greenbacks you know it, it'll just go away so i, I don't know how many are left in circulation that's a little bit different from what you were saying, whereas you were saying that the bankers didn't want the government to have the advantage of elasticity. They wanted to reserve it for themselves. Well, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That's, why okay. the, that's why the law was passed through Congress to restrict them to, to $376 million, and that's it. The government okay. could not okay. issue any more. I guess I can buy that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Paul, your question. Uh, last one. And I think I think um, greenbacks are still lawful money today, aren't they? 
by the way. It's, it's still legal tender, <laughs> what's left. Uh, so my question, it's not really a question, it's something that Sue started off uh, initially that I think may, could be taken the wrong way when she was distinguishing between what she called real money and bank credit money. Uh, I think um, it's pretty much agreed that nowadays that's all we have is bank credit money. So um, that that is what stands in for real money nowadays, which is what we're hoping to change. So um, that's our that's our only um, medium of exchange is bank credit money. All right. Um, uh, Lucille wants to make one last comment and then we'll uh, wrap up. So it's more, it's a, is a question. I did have a few early on, but um, I'll just ask one of them, which was, I think, Sue, you said it was early, like in, you know, more around the 1800 or so. And you made the statement that the government was hesitant to issue money. This was after, you know, the colonies had been doing it. And yeah, Hamilton and, you know, others were trying to really control it. But you said the government was hesitant to, to issue real money. And yet there was all this natural resource and human resource, you know, ready to be tapped. And so the question is, why was the government hesitant? You didn't explain that. Okay, okay. You, have to, you have to go into the struggle that started immediately after the revolution was won. And there was a struggle, and it showed up in the Constitutional Convention, where the power to, for the government to issue its paper money was not, would not be allowed in explicitly in the Constitution. And um, there wasn't uh, a law against the government doing that, but there was um, controversy <laughs> whether what was in the Constitution for the power of money could include issuing that paper money by the government. And it was a struggle. and. I think uh, the, the government tried, like during, uh, you know, they they did, some of the presidents and their treasury department did, like during the war of 1812, there was a need for money. And they did issue some, uh, some treasury notes, you know, um, but it wasn't enough, you know, and then they stopped. So... I don't really know all the in and outs of what was going on in the Treasury Department and the Congress for those years, but the bankers definitely had uh, power in the government, power in the whole, you know, like today, they, and you have the power to issue what's used as the means of exchange out of nothing. It's like the Bank of England. They started it, right? They got a charter from the parliament. And the first thing they did, they, you know, the charter gave them the power to issue their banknotes. You know, they were a private bank, totally private. And the first thing they did is they, they printed up their banknotes and they walked into parliament and they, and they, um, <laughs> they bribed the parliament because the parliament was the only power that could change the charter and take the power to create that, their banknotes and loan them out away from them. And I'm sure similar stuff happened here. Sue, you know, I, I mean, think there was the, the whole thing during um, the, you know, the, the Constitutional Convention where Hamilton was, um, he, you know, he's there and he's like, uh, well, we need to pass a law where the national government will pay all the debts of the revolution right and 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 they're discussing this and he and and some of the of the convention people and and you can find out who they are get together and they send out their agents around the the, the old colonies and they they buy up for pennies on the dollar the debt from the revolutionary war you know people had little pieces of paper that said you know we gave uh this equipment 
to 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 the army when it went by, and and I'm old. This they bought it up at pennies on the dollar, brought it back. The law was passed through the National Congress, and the spec they call them speculators, and they were connected to congressmen, you know, to uh, the people in that convention, the you know constitutional convention, and they got they made a lot of money. I mean that it it started back then, you know it it's like the corruption, men and women, uh, mostly men back then in the government, but people you know people get corrupted by the by the money. Okay, thank you all so much. We ran a little bit over, and we will certainly work with Sue to set up another another time so she can finish going through that outline and we um, can find out uh, the answer to the question um, about the, the wars. Uh, um, so again, thank you all for coming and for you newcomers, we'd love to have you come over to uh, the website monetaryalliance.org and sign up for our emails and we, we'll keep you in the loop. Um, thank so thanks everybody. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Virginia. Thanks, Sue. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Working with y'all.